Welcome to the Daily BA. If you're new here, BA is short for Behavior Analysis. This is the first part of a new series that I'll continue to work on called The Archives, where I'll share something from the past related to the field of, you guessed it, Behavior Analysis. If you're not sure what this field's about, I've got a video right here explaining it all. If you aren't aware of what precision teaching is, guess what, you can go up here, a video as well. Those two will give you a little bit of context as to what's being discussed in this video. So today is a recording of a training that occurred in 1996 at a treatment facility called the Judge Rottenberg Center, led by Ogden Lindsley, that's who's speaking, which I've coincidentally also covered in a separate video, so if you need a little bit more context on his life, check it out up here as well. Now these videos were handed to me from a gentleman named Bob Warsham. Thank you so much for going through the approval process and handing these over. You'll notice what I call a few jump cuts where we just jump ahead in time. This is because there's something from the video that was removed for various reasons, either personal information that people don't want to have shared, client specific information was shared, or we're afraid that things will be taken out of context. Now I have two final things before we start. First of all, this is 1996. This is uh, extremely low res. I've done my best to try to preserve it as well as the audio It is the best that I can possibly do. And much more importantly, in the context of 1996 that I'm asking you to continually remember, it's really, really important to remember that this is a time where different language, different words were used to describe different things. You'll see various medical terminology that is no longer used by this field that is in this video. Just please remember the context. All right, with no further ado, the Ogden Lindsley Archives, Volume One. Uh, you know, we use precision teaching, the chart paper and the principles here and have for many years. And uh, those of you who are new, uh, may not know this, but Dr. Lindsley invented precision teaching in the 60s and invented the chart paper and uh, is a, an eminent figure in the field of behavior analysis and psychology. And uh, what's the difference between a case manager and a teacher? A case manager, uh, well, for a teacher works in the classroom and does the educational and treatment stuff. A case manager is responsible for the details of the programming and the behavior stuff and works with the psychologist. A case manager pretty much manages the program of the student, the treatment program of the student. So a kid would be in a classroom and have both a teacher and a case manager in the classroom? The case manager is not in the classroom all the time. The teacher is in the classroom all the time. Eighty okay. percent of the time, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many of you have attended either workshops, in services, or talks by Dr. Lindsley before? Oh, is, is this going to work against me? <laughs> um, so some of you here don't know about. Know. One of the things that I'm interested in uh, is what's going on with the Morningside Academy stuff. Like, how is that developing? Have, have you the only one that knows about it? Any of you people heard about Morningside Academy? I don't think they know much about it, no. Some general remarks might be good. So this, now you think this is like an important enough topic to spend like 10 or 15 minutes on? It? I think it might be because some of these people don't know the significance of that and the power of these procedures. You know, they may do them every day, but they don't understand the significance. Well, they don't do them morning side way either. Right. Also, historically, we've had the autistic and mentally retarded type of student, and so our two classrooms that you saw Walden Academy and New Beginnings, that's a relatively new kind of thing for us. And so that's that's where the precision teaching and the Morningside Academy stuff really would come in. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'd better sit over here someplace where uh, 
Do you, would you like to sit in this seat? No, no, no. There you go. The Morningside Academy, which is spelled just like it sounds, M-O-R-N-I-N-G-S-I-D-E. That's one word, Morningside. And it was first called Morningside School, and many of the students that went there didn't like it being a school. So Kent Johnson, the director, renamed it Morningside Academy. It began on Morningside Street when Kent Johnson, the director, was about five years old. And he put little chairs in his room and put his teddy bear and the doll and put little animals and things on these chairs and had a school. He called it Morningside School. And he always has wanted to be a teacher or have a school ever since he was a little boy. He grew up and got a PhD in psychology from the University of Massachusetts. His PhD advisor was a woman named Beth Sulza Azarov. I don't know, some of you may have heard of her. She's pretty well known in the field of behavior analysis and education sort of combined. She's since retired and lives with her husband in uh, Florida. But she does not use charts and did not use frequency. Beth didn't, and Kent didn't. But he was taught kind of behavior analysis, uh, behavioral approach to things, rewards, timeouts, schedules of reinforcement, all that sort of stuff. Well, while I'm talking, if there's any word, anything I say, like schedules of reinforcement, that you don't understand, even though you're one of the newest people, say, well, just raise your hand and say, what's that? Because I'd rather go slowly and keep everybody understanding most of what I'm saying than having you miss words here and there. So Kent got his first job at Fernal State School. Does anybody know where Fernal State School is? Where is it? Belmont, what? It? Is it Belmont or Waltham, Massachusetts? Well, it's right where Belmont and Waltham meet. And I think it's on <laughs> Belmont. It's on Trapello <laughs> Road. Right. And I think it's one address is Belmont and the others like Water, Watertown or Waltham. And he was a clinical psychologist at, on the state payroll at Fernal State School. Now, a postdoctoral student of mine named Beatrice Barrett, B-A-R-R-E-T-T, -T, had a research lab at Fernal School. And she would copied my lab, which was at Met State, and was doing the same stuff with retarded kids that I was doing with psychotic people across the street. And he started going to the meetings, her, her class, her lab meetings. And they began to have weekly and monthly chart sharing meetings where they would put charts up and share the progress of their students. And Kent got interested in this and learned more and more and more and then started reading. And so he learned precision teaching from B. Barrett while he was a psychologist at Fernal School and started school, his own school. And he went over $150,000 in personal debt for the first two or three years to get it. No government grants and everything. And as a curriculum in the school, he really committed, you see. He first had maybe 12 kids, and he was a teacher, and then he had a volunteer parent as a teacher aide, and finally he could hire a teacher and finally got the thing going. He just ruled out really physically handicapped kids, spina bifida, terrible droolers, and anything that that he would have to have nurses or anything, any any student taking a lot of drugs, because he wanted to, he couldn't couldn't afford all that. He just wanted to specialize on the the kids he specialized mostly are called ADHD now, but they didn't have that label then. I mean. The, Mostly disturbed, hyperactive, learning disability, brain damage. Those were the words at different times people have put on those kind of kids. 
16. You know what they are. You're, half of your kids are that way. So for a curriculum, he took the best curriculum that I think has really been designed, which is direct instruction. Our teachers don't like it because it's a hell of a lot of work. I mean, when you teach DI by the numbers, you are tired at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's why it's been shot down in public instruction. It's much easier to sit at a desk with a timer in your hand, pass out paper, have your aides collect the paper. And I think probably one of the biggest reasons that the public education is in such bad shape is teachers don't teach. They, they sit down and talk. They do what I'm doing. Blah, 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 blah. And direct instruction isn't that way. You constantly, the kids constantly respond to direct instruction. Has, has anybody ever seen direct instruction go on or know about it? Those of you who took the workshop on Distar Reading saw it. Yeah. But was one given locally here? Yeah. Like, okay. In fact, somebody came to our school in Providence and gave about four, four, four days oh. on Distar. Yeah. So that's just reading. Yeah. Now, Distar has a math. It's a direct instruction math program. Well, probably, you know, talking is almost a waste of time. I mean, I'm almost wasting my time and yours. So the way out is you kind of half entertain and make, make little yeah. jokes and things that like that. But I probably should tell you a little bit about direct instruction and, and why Kent started using direct instruction at Morningside. Direct instruction is a teaching curriculum. It, it's, it's books that you teach from. And it was developed by a guy named, that everybody calls him Ziggy, Ziggy Engelman, E-N-G-E-L-M-A-N-N. -N -N. I can never remember. This. I guess it's one N. And he was a, a PhD in physics. No, I, maybe, that, maybe he's only got a master's. Sort of an engineer and his kid was having trouble in, in elementary school. So he looked at the math program and stuff and thought, this is terrible. Nobody can, nobody can learn this kind of stuff. So he started building his own little curriculum to teach his own son. And out of that, he kept going and finally got working on that pretty much full time rather than his regular engineering job. And he ran into a guy named Wes Becker, who was a PhD in psychology. And Becker said, this is really good stuff. And Becker kind of got government grants and got money and uh, it became Becker Engelman. And they made a corporation called the Becker Engelman Corporation. And then Wes Becker got a job at the University of Oregon. This started out in the University of Illinois campus in Urbana. And, uh, the Becker Engelman Corporation moved to Oregon, and Wes Becker managed to get Ziggy Engelman a, a job as a professor at the University of Oregon in special ed. And they further developed this direct instruction thing. They, SRA, Science Research Associates, sells DISTAR materials. Then along about then, Kennedy, the, the, the Jack Kennedy from <clears throat> Massachusetts became president. It got shot, a lot of things like that. Well, anyway, Kennedy's administration thought education was a real mess. And so they started Project Head Start. Uh, if you've heard of Head Start. Head Start still limping along here and there. I don't, at it, it, one time it had a lot of money. It was doing a good job and, and it sort of, so Head Start was we go into the inner city or we go into districts where children are really handicapped and single family, single parent families and the mothers aren't educated and the, nobody talks correct English around the home and the kids have an awful time, you know, learning to read. The reason most of us learn to read is not the public schools, you know. It's our parents. 
our parents correct our English. And if you have the good fortune to be a, a daughter or a son of educated parents, they correct your, they correct your grammar. And if you have uneducated parents, they, they misteach it. They, you, you speak English correctly, and they say, don't you talk like that? And so you say, me, I have to talk like that? Yeah, that's how you should talk. And so they develop the same speech of their parents. So that's why Head Start was so important, that it had to kind of overcome the, this tendency for the, the people to be trapped in the underclass forever because they, all they can talk is inner city black or inner city Chicano and they, or just inner city dumb, poor, white trash. They can't, they can't get out of that. So Head Start worked. But then they started following the results of Head Start. And when they, when they gave these kids more teachers in the classroom, better curriculum, more aids and things, that's kind of what Head Start was. It was, it was kind of beefed up K through two or three, something like that. They followed the kids to fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth grades. They lost the gain. In other words, the Head Start kids that had this push when they got them up to the middle, they went down, down, down again. So that, that's the very tail end of the Kennedy administration in there. They started Project Follow Through, which would try to follow through on Head Start. And Follow Through was they asked specialists in education over the, all over the country to submit proposals for curriculum to pick up the Head Start kids and carry them on and get them into, into beginning high school. So, so follow through was essentially focused on like three through six or three through seven, something like that, that part of education. It wasn't high school and it, and it wasn't K through three. So when I say K through three, what's K? Hey! <laughs> anyway, so the, they ended up with 20 <coughs> models, they called them. Project, uh, these were the follow through models. There were 20 models for this. And direct instruction was one of them. Behavior analysis was another one. In other words, using tokens and rewards and everything was a behavior analysis model. And it, it came from, uh, from Human Development Department at the University of Kansas. Direct instruction came from Oregon. And there were there were 18 others. There was one that I've forgotten all the names of them. There were one. There was one that had the idea that it was uh, self, not self-respect, but what's the word? That, I got the list of them in my office. You want me to get them? Yeah, yeah, it would be good. So anyway, uh, the idea was that we will we will fund these projects. We will try them for three or four years, and then we will get independent measurement people to measure the, how much they taught. And direct instruction knocked them all silly. Some of the ones that tried to build up self-concept and everything, untaught, in other words, the kids that were in that, those schools that adopted that model, did worse than the, the kids with no model, the control groups. Now, what I found, I, this, this, is, this information has been pretty much suppressed by the NEA and by the, and the, by the Department of Education. I, I find it's criminal. More money was spent on, project, on that research than ever before in history on anything. Your, your dollars were spent to find out the best way to teach people, and the best way was found out, and then it was suppressed. You can't get the results of this. You could go to you go to Washington and try to get the results of, of this research. They they're out of them. They they, you, they pass you to telephone. You don't know what's going on. So then they the first or second time around there was an outfit called APT A B T Associates, and they APT was supposed to independently test the results so there wouldn't be any bias or anything. So the the proponents of the whole language and all these kind of soft, popular approaches said, well, 
we weren't just trying to make math. We were trying to make math and citizenship and, and, and feeling good about yourself. We were teaching a lot of stuff other than just math. So then the second or third year around, apt associates, measures, self-concept, uh, socialization, and all these things. Direct instruction scored higher than on self-concept than the people who tried to teach self-concept did. When I found that out, I thought, that's all she wrote. I am not going to push precision teaching anymore, because if I succeed, I'll be ignored. There's a list of well, th these aren't all 20. This, no. this article has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, the top ten. Let's say. And the names of them are Direct Instruction, Parent Education, Southwest Lab, Behavior Analysis, Bank Street. You probably heard about Bank Street. They made a little computer program and they have a reading program. It's kind of liked by social workers and people from New York. <laughs> Responsive Education, Cognitive Curriculum, Project Team, and Open Education. Now those are the, if you've had any courses in education at universities, that's the shit they teach you. I mean, they, they, they teach this open ed and Maria Montessori, and, uh, 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 write it down, take notes, you're going to have an exam on this. And uh, people believe that stuff, and it does not teach. It's appealing, but it doesn't teach. California adopted whole language. You probably heard of whole language. You know, Give us all last what they, they had it going statewide for about three years. Do you know what the SAT scores were statewide? Below Guam. Cupertino, California, below Guam on whole language. So they finally admit they bought something lousy. And the commissioner of education goes on TV and says, we made a terrible mistake. We need $100 million to correct it. They didn't shoot her. They didn't fire her. They didn't sue her. They gave her the hundred million. They rewarded incompetence at the at the state level, which I think is criminal. Well, anyway, yeah. Well, you know, I've been listening to this crap too for over thirty years, and <laughs> you know, I really, as an educator, um. I'm very ashamed of the educational whole profession because ever since I first walked into my first education class until now, it seems to me that they were always reinventing the wheel. Terrible. And you'd be, and I was in public education, you know, this was in the, you'd have to learn this, then that was out, this was in the spiral and curriculum. And it's just gone. And this whole language is like abysmal, I think. That's but the that worst is one so of ever. Trendy, you know. But I mean, if I don't know about lawyers, but if doctors and scientists and other people approach their profession the way educators do, we'd be still, you know, in the Stone Age. Why is it that we can't get it right and just do it? Why do we have? I guess it's publishing companies. It's people. Yeah, it's um, Grinding their own axes. I don't know what it is, but it's like it's, so disgusting. It's I think. money. Huh? It's money. There's more money in keeping kids dumb than there is in teaching them. There's more money in teaching poorly so you can have four teachers in a classroom. And, and then you have the whole special ed genre that has like mushrooms. That's why if I you really that. knew how to teach, 90% of special ed would disappear. Right. I agree with you. That's right. But it's, it's even worse. When precision teaching was at its peak, right? We, we, precision teaching kind of was really popular. I'm interrupting my story a little bit, but the best school in the country was Sacagawea Weir School in Great Falls, Montana. We had precision teaching building wide. It had started out in first grade, and there were kids, there were kids in sixth grade who had had precision teaching in first grade, in second, and third, and fourth, and those kids were performing beautifully. We had charts that showed the sixth graders who had had precision teaching only in fifth grade and sixth grade weren't doing as well as the sixth graders who had had it for the whole uh, six years. And then suddenly, that program, I asked the people, I said, how's Sacagawea going? Well, it's kind of a bad thing. I said, what happened? Well, he said, they transferred the principal. 
and a lot of the teachers. And a couple of teachers quit. So the next time I was in Great Falls, they, they asked me to do a keynote speech for special ed for Montana or something. Like and there was a guy named Harry Wenist, who was, principal, was superintendent of schools in, in Great Falls. And he caught some kind of fish, what was it, walleye pike or something or other, and, and cooked by his house and, and, and drank Black Jack Daniels whiskey, and I drank a little with him and got him drunk, and I said, Harry, what in the hell happened to Great Falls? He said, well, Arg, he said, you know, there's a lot more to education than just classroom stuff. And I go, oh, here we go. Yeah. So he said, Sacagawea was on the east side of Great Falls, out on the plains, out near the SAC base. And the, the uh, enlisted, army enlisted men had houses out there, and a lot of blue collar workers had houses out there. And between Great Falls and the Rockies, the mountains, Glacier National Park and everything, that's beautiful there. That's where the expensive houses were, the $300,000 houses, and 150, that kind of thing. And he said, when the SAT scores of Sacagawea started climbing and getting the whole class above all the other elementary schools, the property values in the Sacagawea catchment area started doubling and tripling. And the banks had bought all the land between Great Falls and the mountains. And the people that had the land out around Sacagawea were still sheep ranchers and cattle ranchers and wheat growers and stuff. And he said, the powers in town told me, do something about this. So I had, he says, I had to, I had to knock down Sacagawea. I said, why the hell didn't you build up the others? Well, that's a lot easier to say than to do. So that's an aspect of education that you probably don't even think, I didn't even think about those aspects of it. Now, once I get tuned into that, right, I'm in Lawrence, Kansas, and I pick up the, the Lawrence Journal World, and it says SAT scores for Lawrence. Well, I realize, you know, ETS sends these all out at the same time. They don't send them out different. They all come out. Where the hell's Eudora, LeCompton? Where's the neighboring towns? <coughs> right? Two weeks later, they bring out Eudora, which is a, a blue-collar cattle town near Lawrence. It's above Lawrence. Baldwin's above Lawrence, Perry LeCompton, all the neighboring rural hip towns, Class C basketball, are above Lawrence University. So the damn newspaper's in collusion with this. You understand what I'm talking about? If they publish those all at once, people start moving into Eudora to raise their kids, or Perry LeCompton, or marching on the school district and, what the hell's the matter with it? We all my taxes, all in. Why don't we do something about this? And the head of the paper doesn't want to rock the boat for the Junior Chamber of Commerce or anybody. So that's why you can't do it in public construction. It's a, it's a network of money so tight that you know, I used to be, I used to be, you know, I had, I had red hair. My hair got white over this damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very frustrating if you were, if you are a public school teacher. Um, it's been my experience. We have to go with these trends whether they work or not. And some of them are just fly in the face of any reason. Uh, the administrators, most of them in my experience, were, were just perfect examples of the Peter principle. They were the people that couldn't teach, didn't want to teach, went and took these administration courses and became the vice principals, the principals, the guidance counselors, and if they didn't want to go that route, they'd go off into special ed, because then they'd have five kids yeah. instead of like me that had 70-some or whatever it happened to be coming through that. And most of them get sucked in, and then they, then they get 10 years towards retirement, and they... And they, and they oh. have no vision or inspiration or anything. They've done I placed... I switched from special ed to ed ad because I thought, like a damn fool, I thought the school principal could do something. He, he has less power than the janitor. Or the custodian. Janet has the most power. Most power of the whole school. I know. 
I know. I know. So He's been there the longest. His salary yeah. is above most of the teachers. Got to get in go with the janitor. That was my goal. That's right. He runs the it school. <laughs> <laughs> principals, principals come and go, but the custodian stays there. He's been there 28 years at North Kingstown High School, and you don't do anything around there without his approval. But take, it takes you 20 years to find that out, you know, because you, you think principal and his little dude in there with his bow tie or his whatever got his, 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 his you think that he's in, the only thing he's in charge of is what, he doesn't even have control of white color, what color the parking line stripes should be. If the, if the building, if the, you know, the janitor wants them yellow, they're yellow. And the, <laughs> the building principal can't change them. And then you haven't even considered the rulers, the czars, and the czarinas on the school board. Yeah. Who, who are just uh, totally, most of the ones I haven't met, most yeah. ignorant people known to man, who are only there so they can get and then, you know, elected yeah, there yeah, so they can go yeah. on to cause more havoc. Well, anyway, I got to get back to this thing. So, uh, but everything, everything you say is correct. And I, I switched from ed ad, from special ed to ed ad to make school principals who would know precision teaching and could put it in their buildings. And what I did was I trapped about ten or thirteen lovely people who went out and became school principals and couldn't do anything. At most, they might two to two kids in their classroom, in their office or something. They get sucked in by the thing. Some of them, about half of them, moved upstairs and are now in the central office as assistant director of, com of uh, curriculum or some drone type position. And well, anyway, but that's money. That's money. They're getting, they're getting 85,000 a year in the central office. And at the teacher, that they would top out at 45 or something or other. So the other thing about it is every one of them that I got placed as school principals, I say, why don't you, why on your own, why don't you start a little learning center on your own? Because that's where we can do some good. And they say, well, I, I've got 12 years, three months, and four days. <laughs> I said, Ann, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's a functional definition of being in jail. The only people I know in the world that, yeah. that count the time left are prisoners. <laughs> and not all the prisoners do, just the ones that don't like it, just the ones that want to, you know, the kind of prisoners who try to escape don't even keep track of that crap. They're watching the guards and trying to get out of here. <laughs> It's just the drones that it did it kind of put up with. Now you say, what happens to them? Well, they it's terrible now. One of the one of, one of the teachers that started precision teaching got the job as uh, we well, she applied for the prince for the principal of the elementary school in Perry LeCompte, a little town in Kansas, and they liked her so much they put a they put a principal of the high school. She says, but I haven't had a high school principal card. We don't care. We don't, you're so good. We want you to be high school principal. So she became high school principal. And all she knew was precision teaching and a couple of courses in the elementary principal. So I said, you know, her name was Ann Starlin. I said, Ann, what, what, why can't you, why can't you get some precision teaching going in the high school? She says, Ogden, she says, I've got girls basketball, I've got boys basketball, I've got this, I've got that. I said, why the hell won't you make an assistant principal and send them to the basketball games? Oh, I, I would be afraid. She's afraid to even try that. So they, they, get, they get in this system and then they get kind of secure and then they get five or ten years in the thing and, they, and, they, and they're, 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 they're trapped. They're not happy. They're not happy at all. So anyway, now we go back to Kent. So he started Morningside Academy, and the, he used direct instruction because of its power, that it was proven the more effective over and over again, even though it's not adopted by the nation. And, and he added to direct instruction charting. Not teacher charting, kids charting. Kids charting their own performance. And he learned that from B. Barrett, my former student. Then he noticed places in direct instruction where the learnings of the children were not as steep. So he started redesigning the curriculum. 
to, to bring the learning up where, where, where the kids own daily progress on the chart showed where this c curriculum wasn't as strong as other parts and he made so many changes in direct instruction that he called it the Morningside curriculum and started offering that to public schools and so forth and that's had a big effect under my sort of teasing or something, when he started Morningside, I said, if you don't put pressure on yourself, you won't really put pressure on your teachers and they won't put pressure on the kids. So you ought to offer a money back guarantee. I mean, if the public schools did that, some shit would fly. <laughs> In other words, if, if for every kid that didn't hit SAT aim, the money goes away now. I mean, we, you, you can't have $4,000 a kid last year because that kid didn't meet his goal. So Kent offered two grade level gain a year or money back for his, his school, Morningside Academy. And no one has ever collected the stuff. Parents have been moving from Detroit from St. Louis to Seattle to, get, to put their kids in his academy. First, first sort of what happens is the, the kid goes out and the mother goes out and the father visits back and forth and then finally the father gets a new job in Seattle and the whole damn family's there because of Morningside Academy can, can grow this kid and the other schools can't. So this attracted a lot of attention. Now there's a guy named Joe Lang, L-A-Y-N-G, who had He's a student of a very dear friend of mine named Israel Goldimer, and he got a PhD from the University of Chicago. And Joe's a dyed-in-the-wool Chicago guy. And he built a computer company in the early days of Apple called Enabling Technologies. And the, well, the computer company went bankrupt, and he had his own money and stuff. And so he took a job as running the Educational Resource Center at Malcolm X college, which is a community college right in the middle of the worst part of the black part of Chicago. I mean, the real, the projects, all the drugs, the, all the stuff. Malcolm X was built um, by the city of Chicago in an attempt to kind of assuage or, or, or somehow get votes out of the projects. And it's a, it's a beautiful building. It's one story and it's low and it's jet black with big white Malcolm X college, big letters across the top. A great big parking lot, and at the other side of the parking lot is the Chicago Bulls Stadium. So, I mean, this is, this is you know, this is kind of, you know, Chicago Bulls. It's with red. Malcolm X got a black hat with a red X and the thing. So Joe took a job there to run the Educational Resource Center, which is supposed to help people who are in community college and want to get an LPN and they read at the sixth grade level and they're 28 years old. And so he, he knows Kent. And so he put the Morningside curriculum at Malcolm X and treated them just like Kent treats his 10 year olds. And it went like bang. They get two grade levels gain in both reading and math in 16 hours of instruction with adults. That, that's what we're capable of if we use the correct curriculum. That's attracting a lot of attention. Medgar Evers, which is a kind of a sister, deep inner city, tough area, community college in New York, is so impressed with the fact that Malcolm X can do this. The only, the only non local person at Malcolm X in the Malcolm X program was Joe. He, he was white and he went there and he started this. He's very skillful and he passed all their tests. He, he found out that they finally decided Joe really cares. But all everybody else is black. It's black on black. And I think that impresses like Medgar Evers and stuff that whatever this crap is, it ain't all wash shit and you can learn how to do it and your own people can help do it and then, you know, and it works good. And uh, Mayor Daly found out about it and pulled 20 school, well he, he wanted 50, 
pulled 50 elementary schools away from the city board of education, put them directly under his control, and he wanted to put Morningside model into 50 schools. Kent Johnson said, there's no way I can train 500 teachers or something or a thousand. So Kent talked them into bringing it down to 20. So 20 schools started in September. They're not demanding that they teach it, they're offering it. They're offering it. And out of the 20 schools, as of now, about 12 have kind of bought it. The schools are primarily black. Uh, maybe like eight out of 10 of the students are black and probably seven out of 10 of the teachers are black. And all of the principals are black. So it's, and we don't know how it'll do in the public schools. There are some people thinking that they're trying to do too much too fast and, and uh, but uh, Joe's very skillful and uh, it's a good program builder. For example, one of the things that endeared him to Malcolm X was he, he noticed that when there's a Chicago Bulls game, the Chicago Bulls stadium is there, and then he's parking lot, here's Malcolm X. When there's a Chicago Bulls game, a lot of the people park in the Malcolm X parking lot. And Joe thought, aha. So he went to the head of the Chicago Bulls and said, look, why don't you rent that parking lot from Malcolm X? for game time and charge him. So he swung the deal and he got 300000 a year into Malcolm X. No, no strings on it. The D's can do any damn thing they want with it from the Chicago Bulls. That's the kind of thing, I think, that made the Malcolm X deans and the Malcolm X teachers and things say, well, not so bad to have this guy around. I mean, he's a, he's a pretty cool cat. So. Okay, now, so what is the Malcolm, what is the Morningside Model Academy thing? Well, in precision teaching, it, it's absolutely important that the kids put their own dots on the chart. And they have two charts. They have a daily chart, which they put the best timing for the day or whatever, and they have a timing chart where if they're learning new stuff, whenever they call it establishing, whenever you're teaching something like basic ad, and all you've been doing before that is numbers in sequence, that you, you teach the basic ad, not at the overhead, so you teach it with like 10 second timings. Everybody has a little practice sheet and, and you do 10 second timings. And you put the result of each timing on a chart so that instead of having the day line be a day line, the line is, is the first 10 second timing. Then you do another 10 second timing and you put that and you do 10 or 15 of them. And if those timings aren't doubling, you do something. So the kids, the kids know that they should be times twoing on their timings chart. And they know they should be times twoing on their daily chart. So Kent was the first one of us to set what I call acceleration aims or learning aims. And they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty strong. Owen White, way back in 78 or 80, set times 1.25 as kind of a special ed catch-up aim. But all on their own, occasionally a kid will do times four. So it's criminal when the mind is capable of four miles per hour to have him be going 1.2. Now this is something sort of new to, to me. This sounds like a, a system that you haven't taught me about yet. And that is like doing multiple... It tells a lot I haven't taught you about. Well, yet. <laughs> I know, and there's not enough time left. But it sounds like what they're, they've moved to is many 10 second timings as opposed to few 60 second timings. Is that what you're no, telling me? No, no, no. What they've done is put self charting. But they've, done, they've done two things, two big things. One is they set times two aims. Almost nobody ever set times two aims on the chart. I couldn't get Eric to do that. 
everybody set fluency aim, number per minutes, but nobody ever set a learning aim of how should it be to get there. On a daily chart or on the daily chart. chart? On the daily chart, they all should be timed. There are no flat charts at Morningside. If you've got a flat chart, you'll be the taught the goddamn thing and you should go forward or you haven't taught them enough to speed up on the thing. If it's a flat chart and it's low or if it's a shallow chart, you should probably should go back and teach the tool skills to 200 a minute and then it'll go up at times two. This is a, you know, I, I built the chart for that. I built this to be and it's taken, what the hell, it's taken 67 and it's taken 30 years for somebody to get the guts to do it. I realize now I should have done it. I should have. I shouldn't have tried to push great falls and place principles and fart around like that. I should have. I should have probably just quit KU, got twenty or thirty kids, and started the Lindsley Academy. And you'd have seen astronomical learning. But I tried to get other people. I tried to. I tried to get it into society to, rather than make a demo. When you look back on the history of education, you can go back two hundred years. The real innovators had their own schools. None of it ever came out of public instruction any place. Maria Montessori had a, the children's school. But the Dewey, said, John Dewey had his own school. Mariana Frostig of the Frostig material had her own school. And went like when Montessori deviated, the Canadian Montessori, which is a little different from the Italian Montessori had its own school. So right now, the the front line precision teaching things are their own schools. They're the private schools. We just had an international precision teaching conference. There's almost no one there from public instruction. They they can't afford to go. University professors can't go. They don't they don't have money anymore. They only have maybe one money for one trip a year. So they go to association behavior analysis or something, or they go to CEC or something, or they don't even go to any. They have to rotate. This isn't my year for a conference. This kind of a thing. The private schools, little private schools, the directors there, the assistant directors there, four teachers and two kids from Hartford, Connecticut to Seattle. But it's very clear, and I, I thank God that I aimed some of them into private schools because that has worked. That has worked. But I'm mad at myself that I didn't put the whole damn thing in private schools in 1970. It's terrible. So the private schools is the way to go, and uh, I think, in a lot of ways, I think learning center is better than private school because learning center. You don't have to worry about athletics. You don't have to worry about all the stuff that's killed the public schools, all the crap, AIDS instruction, sex, no parenting. All. I mean, uh, if you, the amount of other stuff you have to teach than math and reading in public school is horrendous. Every time something happens, a new disease comes, some Christ almighty, you're in public health service and you have to have to hang penises up on the wall and, and blow up condoms. And, it's just incredible. I mean, the, the parents should be doing this. But I mean, the parents have, have, put, the, have put everything on the public schools back. And, you know, I, in a way, I feel sorry for the public schools. But consequently, math, math and education and reading has gone to, to the bottom of the heap. But even private schools are under the regulation of the, the pro, um... Not a learning center. Oh, a learning center. Not a learning I, I'm center. like, we're under, you know, regulations from all Oh, I know, states, I know. And, that's what know, I and we've got to do. That's what I said. I said the, I am I said if number one, you gotta go private. And number two, you're better off as a learning center than you are as a school because you have these other problems with it. The learning center you don't have any problems at all. You just get a storefront so, and you, the kids are in regular school. And then they come to you and say after school or sat or whenever the They parents. come to you two hours a week. But the point I'm trying to make is, the nice thing about it is, the best thing about it is, the score is their performance in the public school. You don't have any mental testing, any achievement, and none of that at all. And the, the ladies sit there having their hair shampooed or something or other, and say, how's Tommy do? Well, I haven't told you about that. No, well, what happened? Well, he, he says, I, he's gone to the Houghton Learning Center. How long? Well, two months. 
He's getting all A's now. His last report card was all A's, and they were going to hold him back this year. How learning said How much? Thirty-five an hour, twice a week. Really? Seventy bucks? Jesus, I don't know. That's the, that's the thing. I'm serious. And that's how the words. It takes two two years for enough hair to get washed, for the word to spread, for enough grades to feed back. I'm, I'm serious about this. Now, the catch-22 is, if you handle it right, the learning center, what you do is you put the kids' allowance through the learning center. <coughs> Some of these blue-collar kids are getting 30 bucks a week for breathing and not pooping on the floor. <laughs> God, they don't have to mow the lawn. I'm serious about this. So if you can get that through the school, then when the kid reaches a name, you hand him a key to the cash box, and he goes and he gets a nice, crisp $5 bill for the coach and one for himself. And he earns his allowance through math acceleration. Now, I don't have many of the learning centers sold on that one yet. But that's Morningside. So Morningside and Malcolm X is creating a, a lot of attention. Now, the professionals, the professors and stuff, are saying, I don't believe it. I mean, that's uh, hype. I mean, uh, you can't trust Joe Lang. He had a computer company that went bankrupt. Uh, you know, all bad-mouthing it. And they're trying to do research on it and, and sort of disprove it with latency stuff and so forth. But if, if you, if you, uh, you know, if you lose your job here or if you have a sister who is as a school teacher and she's got three kids and she's worried that she's not spending enough time with her kids and they're young and her husband works in the construction industry and she could stay home if she could get a little source of income i would say tell her to start a learning center put in a good curriculum first start teaching out of the front room of the house get five to ten to fifteen kids then rent a little storefront tax deduct the room in the house and let her go then you tax deduct the car and the first thing you know you're member of the free enterprise system yeah how do you feel about about the voucher system i don't i don't even want to discuss it it's uh <laughs> it it's a good idea but it will uh i mean it's it's okay. the nea has spent so much money to shoot it oh, down that's a, oh. voucher b-o-u-c-h-e-r not goucher that's a college <laughs> anyway no, so talk. anyway that's that's direct instruction and the, the, the thing the thing that are advances within precision teaching that Kent did, which I think is the heart, heart of the effectiveness, is the timings, times two on the timings to establish, to introduce the topic, and times two on the dailies to maintain the learning. So t two acceleration aims, and probably People used to do 10-second timings and things, but they were, they were not, they would be like backed into them. In other words, you, the reason, we used to advise people to do a 30-second or 10-second timing when the kid could not handle a one-minute timing. Well, you kind of back into it. Well, maybe for 10 seconds, can't you just keep your finger out of your nose for 10 seconds, for Christ's sakes, and do numbers in sequence? Yes, and so we go to a 10-second timing as a kind of a, of a way of trying to get a timing done, rather than the way that we all would do something for the first time. You see, even you and I can, can do something that's difficult. We, we have enough attention skill so that we can do something for the first time that we're not very good at for a whole minute, right? Now, if we did it for only 10 seconds and did 10 or 20 of those, we would probably learn it quicker than if we did it for one minute. In other words, if, if you analyze your own mind when you're doing this one minute thing and you're getting, and you don't really know what the hell you're doing, you, you try to guess it and stuff like that. You, you having little interrupted thoughts like, what, what the hell am I doing this for? And, you know, she, she should have explained this better, and that kind of stuff's going through your head while you're trying to write the numbers and the damn timer's going and stuff. So, but with only 10 seconds, none of that happens. 
he, and there was even a normal person doesn't get interrupted with kind of interrupted type thoughts. We don't go off task, we just have a thought interrupted when it's only 10 seconds. So that whole, that whole 10 second thing is, is, is a real, I think, a real major contribution when you think about it. What, when would you do like the next, uh, how many of these? Say you said 10 to 15 per day. So you do something you hear, you hear the name. Okay. And, and uh, the Morningside curriculum has worked out these aims. Like for, for each curriculum step, there's an establishing aim, which is the 10 second aim, right? And, and it said like uh, before we go in to daily one minute timings or something on numbers in sequence, we ought to get numbers in sequence up to at least, we'll say, uh, 30 a minute in 10 seconds, or 50 a minute in 10 seconds. And then you would do a daily timing. Then you, and then then you go to aim. one minute timings, you see. And have aims That's for right. that, yeah. and then. Well, the aims for that are healthy. They're 200, 300. Yeah. Yeah. But then every time you introduce a new skill, yeah, or yeah, you would yeah, do the 10 minutes, yeah, uh, 10 yeah, seconds, yeah. until... The biggest thing lacking in the public schools is the kids are in addition and subtraction, and, and they, they can't even write a nine. They, they, they are, when they write a nine, they, you know, they can't tell their own nine from their own four. Mm because they don't always close the top of the nine up, and they don't cross the four line over. In fact, there are a lot of tricks, a lot of little tricks in here, little detailed tricks. When you get really into the curriculum, like I teach all my kids to write sevens. You, you know you know how. You don't, you don't write a seven like this. You write a seven like this. You cross that seven bar so it will never, ever, ever be confused with a one. Now, if you, if you are trying to do arithmetic on your own work, and, and you, you, your, pro, your arithmetic process is interrupted by your thing, what the hell, is that a seven? Oh, that's probably a one. Because the, the, the seven, the, you know, it, it, didn't, it wasn't a nice, clean seven. I still to this day have trouble when I write small in a hurry, in poor light, like in an airport terminal and I'm writing in my day timer, some telephone number somebody's given me, I have trouble telling my fours from my nines. Later, I look in there, I, Jesus Christ, and I dial it and I get, you know, Wilson Plumbing! And, oh, sorry, what's the number? And they tell me, and it's, oh, it's 949 rather than 999 or something like that. So you have to get legible letters that t you, you build these tool skills up to 200, 300 a minute and perfect before you even put them into the stuff. And then, then you get steeper learning. So I, I teach kids to cross sevens. And I teach kids to cross fours. You know, when, when it, I don't know. The, there's a pad. There's a marker there to make the four like this, so that line goes out a little bit there, so you can tell. There's one of those. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, see, a lot, a lot of us, that, that, that's, that's sticking out there, and that separates from that. A lot of us will have a thing, uh, there's four and that's nine, and that's, you can't even figure out your own stuff. Or this is, uh, that's seven and that's one. But if you, if you do this, that, then you know that's a seven. That, that's taught in Europe, all, all over Europe, they, they, they teach that. But they don't always teach them to stick their fours out. If, you, if you're writing in a hurry, you're out to go like that, and, and this, this, this didn't come out. That is just, that's not a really important thing, but it, it's details like that you get into when you have these kinds of requirements on the learning. When you, when you're making times two and affirming, on the timing sheets, and you're making. The... So at first, Kent and his crew would just use a daily chart, and they made the day lines the timings, and 
the week lines, the Sunday lines, are the next day. In other words, so they had room for seven timings each day on a daily chart. And they would have to have those be times two angle on those timings. You know what we've been using for that kind of thing? We use the, uh, the monthly chart that has on the y-axis median. So you've, you've got this on the y-axis, and you've got uh, months across uh -huh. here. And that works out pretty well. Yeah. Well, they, so much of this got going. And now that they're involving the public schools, and Kent has installed the Morningside curriculum. He, the way he teaches it, he doesn't sell the book or anything. He sells a site license to a school district. And the school district says, how many buildings are you going to put this curriculum in? And they say, and depending on how many that is, they have to pay so much per year to use this curriculum. And they're free then to copy as many copies as they want to within their district. They have a site license. And so much of that got going that he asked me to make up some, some special timings charts which have like 10 seconds and 30 seconds and 20 seconds on it and they, they're 10, 10, 10 minute timings. And so those charts are now made and they're being sold and they're available. And they wanted them on cheaper paper. This paper is very expensive. I don't think you can even buy this paper anymore. The last, the last price on this paper was $45,000 for a train load. We still buy it from you. It probably won't after a while because I don't know if you know what's happened to the paper world, but you've probably read in the paper about doubling in price every year and stuff like that. But it's even worse than that because they're running out of trees. And they, the quality paper is made out of more trees than, than is the poor up recycled and newsprint and all that. So they wanted the timings chart to be throwaways that wouldn't care if it turns yellow or tears in a month because they're only going to use them for 10 days and they probably aren't even going to keep them or something. So we printed those on commodity offset, which is bottom of the line, $22 a ream printed, packaged, shipped. So what the, uh, there's, there's no money in that. It's, it's just a pain in the butt, but it's just a service to get it going. And then they wanted a daily chart, which was cheaper for Chicago, on poorer paper without the corners cut. Mm -hmm. The timings chart doesn't even have the holes drilled. And the, the, the daily per minute chart, which is the new daily chart, is on smooth offset, which is one peg above commodity offset. That's like $37 a ring compared to 60 for this. I have copies of that of that kind of chart paper if you want it. And, uh... Do you have it on computer disk? What? Do you have it on computer disk by any chance? Do I have what on a computer? Um, I'm just wondering if if this is a... the chart itself. The chart. Yes. So you can plot it on the computer. Right. No, we do. We do. I do here. I was just curious. There's three ways you can do that, mm -hmm. but uh, the best way, which. Uh, Bob invented a, a way of doing that with a, an Excel template and a program, a computer program called Excel that will make charts. But there's an even more powerful program now, a chart program that's within StatView 4.5, which will make even better, more similar charts. The trouble with the Excel chart, the Excel program is you have trouble putting stuff in margins and so forth because it will change the size of the grid. The StatView program will hold the size of the grid constant no matter what you put in the margin. And that has also got more options on fonts and sizes. It's but a lot more expensive though. $400. Yeah. If what you're interested in is learning, you don't want them in the computer anyway. The kids aren't going to learn anything with in the computer. You, you want the kid to have it just like the practice sheet. In other words, the practice sheet is not complete unless the chart is with it. After each timing, you put a dot down. 
each 10 second timing you put a dot down. You don't write a number up here and then do it at the end of the day or the teacher does it, any of that stuff. That's our next step, Sal. What? I don't have, I guess I, they're in my, uh, I was gonna say, I don't have a whole lot of those yeah. charts with me. <coughs> no. Oh yeah, I do. Can you do why don't I Xerox this so that you don't uh, lose all those good blue? You want me to Xerox this? No, no, <laughs> Did anybody have any questions about what we talked about earlier at all? I was just, I mean, we've talked about this many times over the years, but with the self-charting, you always stress how important the self-charting is, and some of our guys... I know. Some of the, the lower functioning students, in that, which is the majority of well, our students. You know, I don't... I don't know the names of your classrooms anymore, but the... The ones that are on GEDs and are still pushing their finger through a plastic hole mm. on a computer screen, yeah, that, that's, that's not appropriate. But almost everybody in New Beginnings, almost everybody... In the academy. You see, now, if, if you... If, if, with real special ed kids, if, if you make teaching, putting the dot on the chart, one of the first things you teach them, they, they learn to do that, then uh, I mean, you, may, you may spend two months, half an hour a day, teaching them where to put dots on the chart. But then, you see, it, it's not just to save the teacher time, it's to give the kid the immediate feedback and the not only the, the performance feedback but the learning feedback that his dot is above where it was before. You might be able to now there's a lot of tricks. There's a lot of tricks in teaching kids to chart. One of the biggest tricks is, and, the, and you know I don't know which is best. One of the biggest tricks is if you have four or five kids in a room. And you try to teach the chart, and then one of them, one of them learns. And you know, sometimes you don't know what it was that caused him to learn. You don't know what part of your teaching clicked it. But anyway, he knows. So he immediately becomes a charter for the whole rest of the class. I have a lot of problems teaching some staff how to chart. I mean, never mind. I, I do. <laughs> you know, I mean, when I, I do a lot trying to teach some of them. When one, when one kid in the class is charting, and then he puts the dots down for the other kids, or you know, he, he doesn't, you don't give him the stack of the charts and he just does it. He, he goes by their desk and helps them put their dot down. Then he goes by their next desk and helps them put their dot down. Almost always, if there's five or six or ten kids in the classroom, someone, someone else damn well doesn't want him doing his and, and he somehow learns his own just like that. And also, there's usually one that, that never want, they always want somebody else. They want the, the social content. They want somebody else to do it for them or something. Yeah. So you don't care. But it's, the. I noticed in, in the New Beginnings classroom uh, also in the Your Precision Teaching classroom You've got the kids really separated. I mean, the kids are as far apart from each other as they can be in that size room. The only way you would probably put them closer together is if a new kid came in, then you'd have to kind of put them there. But, I, 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 and I know one reason you have them far apart is of a distraction and they may hit each other and they may get a fight or some damn thing. But the one of one of the most effective techniques that we've ever used in precision teaching classrooms is have uh, timing buddies and chart buddies. So they they like 
to set each other's timing mm -hmm. and they do each other timing. Don't do teacher timing. Teacher timing wastes a lot of time. It's better than not, not doing any timing. And it's probably where you start. But after a while, then you get there's a whole bunch of timers in the room and they do their own timings and they correct each other's practice sheets. And if you've got three kids that know how to chart and three kids that don't, then you put a chart knower in a buddy team with a non-chart knower and, and the chart knower does it. And then eventually, almost by magic, they both know how. So that's the kind of way that people would, would chart buddies and chart teams. And a kind of, it's kind of fun and they get going and, and, uh, rather than having all teacher directed, teacher directed. And if you have them doing the timing, some timers are, are, are too complicated. Some of the Radio Shack timers and stuff, geez, you, you've got too many buttons on them. So we found out that the cheaper timers are better than the, than the good ones. And uh, there's certain, and the, you know, the terrible thing is that Radio Shack makes, I mean, they'll have a good timer available for six months and then suddenly it won't be there anymore and you can't get it and you wish you could. And the one they've got in place of it, they say it's a better timer, it'll do more things and this kind of thing and it costs less, but it's, it's screwed up because it's too complicated for the kids. I might have the, currently one of the best timers I might have, uh, this is a radio shack, and uh, this is a radio shack, and, and to, to set, has nice big letters, nice big black numbers on it, and to, to, to put the, to put the numbers in, like say I want to put in 10 seconds, you just do one, and the one goes here. Then I put a zero and it moves it over to 10 seconds. So now it's set for 10 seconds. So all you have to do now is to do start, and it will time down. If you stop it. And if you want to do it over again, it automatically goes back to 10 seconds. You just do the second time. This is two buttons. And <coughs> so if I wanted to interrupt it, I could stop it and start it again. I want, but almost never do you want to interrupt the 10 seconds, but you might want to interrupt the five minute time. Or something. This will go up to 99 minutes. But now, the reason I showed you this is what, if you start going into the buddy teams and kids doing their own timings and running their own timers and stuff, uh, if it's a one minute timing, they can watch a clock get it to close to 60. So if it's a 10 second timing, it's pretty hard to do it from a clock. We can, but a simple timer like this is better than the one that the one I saw in your classroom was more complicated, had a whole bunch of like buttons. That's a little hard to give those to some of the kids. This is a radio shack and I think it's about 1295 or something like that. Are there any questions about that? So any other questions about what we talked about earlier? Let's see. So you probably, uh, depending upon the success of those Chicago schools, you'll probably begin hearing about on 2020 or 60 Minutes, or you'll begin hearing about this, because it is so much more effective. You know, it's not just twice as Powerful. It's like a hundred times more. I mean, two grade levels in 16 hours is really moving. I mean, that's. Well, we know that. I mean, I've seen charts with with learning lines at time 16 just happening by chance. So the human mind is capable of really going 
like a bat out of hell. And the, the faster people learn, the more fun they have and the better they like it. Some people end up spending their whole life in a, in a field that they learn fast, like chemistry. They end up a chemist because of their first chemistry thing, they learned it fast. And they make the mistake of saying, well, I must have a chemical mind, you know. So we're, we're doing some exciting things. And Any any other questions at all about what I, I don't want to go into another topic or anything. It is it's going to be lunchtime pretty soon. Yeah, I mainly wanted to know about your new chart paper mm. and uh, the multiple timing stuff. I mean, from what I've seen, we've sort of been feeling our way in Sally's class, and we're using multiple timings, but we've settled on three a day for numbers. Not enough. And 30 seconds in length. 30 seconds too long. And what I'm seeing is for some of these students, you'll see uh, like acceleration like that within one day over the three timings. It won't necessarily carry over to the next day. No, it'll drop down the next day. But uh, the, the things will, the things will, the timing shot will look like this. It will look like this. These would be the days, and it will, it will be like that. And, and, and no, I didn't, I didn't do that steep enough. It, the bottoms will go up and the tops will go up. It'd be like a sawtooth. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. So what should we do? What? So what would you recommend we do? Whatever you want. More timings and a shorter <laughs> well, shorter, more timings at a shorter. Oh, your length. classroom. Yes. Uh, my recommendation for your classroom would be to uh, free it up a little. Oh, you're, you're too much. You're too much running it rather than coaching it. Uh, it would be real neat if you could have one of the guys do the timings for the whole pack and you kind of watched and looked at the numbers they were making and, and you were free to one-on-one, -on -one, you were free to notice a problem. See, right, right now you're not free, you're, no. you're, the, you're the referee, you're, you're, the, you're the, everybody ready? On your mark, get set, go! You see, well, anybody can, that's not teaching. That, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not critic. I don't want to be mean or anything, but you, you, your real ability to help one of those kids isn't being exercised at that. It, but now, if if you had them doing their own timings and you looked at their charts and say, I wonder why this is not as steep here, or say the chart starts going down, we might have to back up to a tool skill. The, See, the, the more the more you run the class the way you're running it, the more you tend to lockstep it. The more the, the more you tend to get them on the same practice sheets, the more because it's it's hard to individualize it. And then also besides that, I was wondering like what length of time samples. That's what I was really you know what length, how many times, and that kind of thing. Yeah. See, you can have. And you'll find this out. You'll find this out if you can get yourself right now. Right now, you're busy running it. But if, if you can get it so it kind of runs itself, it could be, it could be, with a thirty-second timing, they look like this. Don't you just run that sometimes? Each, each are days, and each one needs a separate you. timing okay. in the day, right? Yeah. It looks like this. Okay, it could be with 10 second timings, it looks like this. In other words, you're getting steeper learning and you're getting some overall growth, where here is, you're not getting much growth. Yeah, that's what we're getting on that first thing, right, Bob? Yeah. Basically. Yeah, and then once in a while they'll get up in, into yeah. the criterion that we shift. It's not like they do start all over the the next See, day, the, 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 big, the big problem that we all have, me, do you realize that I, 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 I was running around the country from like 1972 to 1995 saying, for Christ's sake, set times two, set acceleration names. And I didn't even do it in my own classes. 
and Kent did it. I don't know why he, but and a lot of the other people did. not And uh, one of the one of the teachers from Elizabeth Houghton School went and visited Kent School, and and went back to the Houghton Learning Center, and she took a chart where the kid was and took a yellow uh, underliner pen and drew a line at times two, and, and the kid stayed in it. And she says, I, never in my life have I been blown away like that. And all her charts were flat before that. And it wasn't until in her mind's eye she realized they can do it and put a yellow thing on there that the kid stayed in. So, uh, I forget her last name. Her first name was Samantha, the teacher that did that. But So it's hard. To, the, the hardest thing for us to do is to separate learning from performance, and they're totally separate. A thing that's easy to do might be hard to learn, and a thing that's hard to do might be easy to learn. And, and we, since we've never seen them separated before, we have to confuse them. The general public thinks if it's hard to do, it's hard to learn. And if it's easy to do, it's easy to learn. That's just ab absolute opposite, just about. So, like, it could be that if he, if he can do this in 30 seconds, that if we went to 10 seconds, he wouldn't, we wouldn't, he wouldn't learn as much. That's the way you would logically argue. So 30 seconds isn't too long for performance, but it is too long for learning. Mm -hmm. I know you're having trouble because the world has been wrong for 6,000 years. And, and I, I'm trying to change your mind in 20 minutes. <laughs> and I, I, it's taken me a long, long, long time to, uh, to learn this. I was even against one minute timings when they started. My yeah, students. That's all. that's all we've always done. One minute, one minute, one minute, one minute. Yeah. But when I mean before, before JRC or BRI existed, when my students, I, I said you should count it all. In other words, if you do 30 minutes of math, the whole 30 minutes should be on the chart. Based upon the laboratory research, we, we should monitor, we should track all the behavior. Don't just do mental tests, for Christ's sakes. Don't do mental tests. I thought one minute timings is just a whole bunch of little tests. It's not learning at all. The kids will only only do it in the timing. And, uh, and uh, how you gonna how you gonna have these one minute time? Now we do know that the one minute timing is the best spreader. If you have like three one minute timings on a day on math, it's best if they're spread over the day than if they're all in one little clump. Okay, that's a good question. When we do multiple timings in her class, how close together should the timings be? Because she's doing them probably maybe one or one and a half minutes between a timing. Depends what you say. Depends what you what you want. What you want. Uh, it, you'd get more learning out of three timings if they were spread over the day than if they were clumped together. There's no doubt about that. But there's a management problem. When you clump them together, it's easy. You've got the sheets out, you've got the timer. It's all right, timing's time, and, and you do it. That's one reason that the teachers in big precision teaching classrooms put the timings under the control of the children so that the class time is the teacher doesn't ever do any timings. The kids do them during lunch break. They do them when they're hanging up their coats in the morning. They do them when they get ready to go home. They just know that they've got to do three, three math timings and three language timings somehow this day and get them on their damn charts and get them up on the wall. And they fit them in where they can. That's the way the best public school and the best kind of school precision teaching classrooms go. I wish we could actually observe a classroom that this is going on with a group of students. And you have trouble visualizing this. In practice, yeah, the best the best precision yeah. teaching classrooms teachers are talking about one fifth of the time. All the rest of the time is practice 
and the children of, of the learners are guiding their own practice. And they're all they're all practicing different things. All right. But now, what are their academic subjects? Now, are they in, say, ones in world history? I mean, and this is for regulations. I mean, they have to finish a history course or an English course or in literature and, you know, I mean, we've got health and science and some have earth science and some have, yeah. you know, biology well, and... Well, that, see, that's what, like, Morningside curriculum is moving up into junior high and high school. Okay. And it now is designing curriculum materials for those levels. Yeah. So, so for things like social need, studies? Yeah. What? For things like social studies? Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, that's, so you see, have timing, you have practice sheets, you know, all that stuff. I'm deluged with all that other stuff, too, that they need, you know, for the LEA. And then, you know, Bob's helped us with some of the... See what? You know, it's, if if you're not if you don't if you're not aware of it, you're apt to think well timings only work for basic ad facts and uh, uh, cursive writing and uh, grammatical capitals, grammatical so stuff state capitals this kind of thing. And that's not true. You can you can do timings on putting a condom on a broom handle. <laughs> I'm serious about that. Now you got to have more than one condom, and you probably yeah, should have. Broom 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 you probably handle. have twenty or thirty broom handles, and it probably should start with ten seconds. And I'm serious. Anything in the world that you're trying to teach can be put into practice sheets and timings and that structure like that. Mm. Oh, I I believe that, but it's just that. It takes a lot of development time to take yeah. social studies material and design Break stuff it. that you can go fast on. Break it down. And the teachers don't have that kind of time. I know that. And, I know that. And so, uh, and, uh, Tell me about it. I mean, I, I know that most of the curriculum that you can go by are, are destructive. They're, they're, worse, they're worse than no curriculum because they piss the kid off and turn him off on history forever. The math curriculum should not be used. Kids would be better off learning math on their own in a hardware store than, than going through the multiplication table. There's absolutely no doubt about it. When, when, you, when you go through regular math stuff, the first thing are you learn, I, I must not have a mathematical mind. So I'm going to have to be an artist or, or go into literature or yeah. performing arts. I think I think I'll be a ballet dancer because I, there's no way in the world I could be a physician because I have to know math to get to organic chemistry and I never could get into medical school. Yeah. And it's because you can't tell your fours from your nines, you damn fool. <laughs> you can't tell your sevens from your ones. I mean, you you were butchered in K through three, and you would you know you were taught that. 0, 6, 12, 18 is the multiplication table. No, 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 that's successive add. You don't even know what multiplication is, you know. What, what's multiplication? So, okay, all together now, let's start at 0 and multiply by 2. Okay, wait, come on. Zero. What, what's the next number? Zero. What? Zero. 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 What's the next number? Zero. 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 Okay. Zero. Zero. So we do know that zero doesn't even exist in the multiply world, right? So now we'll do, we'll do start with one, and we're going to do times two. What's the next number? Two. The next number. Next number. Come on. Two. What? Two. Two. Four. Oh, what next? Eight. Eight. 16. So, okay, go, go start over again and I'll pace you, right? Okay, we go, okay. First number is one, next number is two. two four, eight, 16, Keep going. 32, 16, Keep going. 4, 28, 2, 56. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we get screwed up about here, right? Yeah. We can't go 256, 512, 10, 24. We can't do that. If we did, we'd know that's why a computer doesn't have a thousand in it. It's ten twenty-four is one k. Okay, so next, let's do times six now. Everybody ready? Okay, one, six, six 12, 
No. 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 One, six, twelve? You're doing ad. God damn it. Ad. Oh, let's start over again. One, six, thirty-six. Do you realize that you were never taught nullification? You were taught successive addition. Okay, had you learned multiplication, and I asked you the question, we visited my grandmother's house two weeks ago and saw a cockroach in her kitchen. This week we saw two. If we don't do anything, how many will be there in a year? A lot. What? A lot. <laughs> Write a number down. Write a number down. How many do you think will be there? Probably 20 zeros. One with a 20 zeros. 400,000. So, see, nobody, that's why we have trouble with cancer. That's why we travel with pollution. We do not understand multiplication. We don't realize how, how fast you have to move, how fast things multiply. <laughs> So, so Kent Johnson and I right now are working on a curriculum, K through three, in which we're going to teach the five number worlds. And, and there's a number name, number order, number add, number multiply, and number power. Name, order, add, multiply, power. So if I put pennies in a piggy bank, <coughs> one, a, one a day, what world is that in? At the end of 10 days, how many pennies will I? That's the ad world, right? If I put $10 a week in a bank, what world is that in? Multiply. 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 It'll grow times 1.08 or whatever, the 1.03, whatever the interest is. Right? Where's cancer? Multiply. Where's rust? Multiply. Where's people? <laughs> Almost nothing is that, and yet that's, that's the only one we learn. Yeah. And the whole world's in here. <laughs> Michael Jordan has 23 on his basketball jersey. What, what world is that in? Name. name. What? Name. name. Number name, right. Uh, 295, Highway 295, what world is that in? Name. Name? If you're on 295, can, where's 495? Doesn't matter. Oh. Doesn't matter? <laughs> no. No, every city in the world, 295 or 495 so, uh, are concentric, right? It's in the order world. Highway. I-70, is I-70? Is I-70 above or below I-60? Above. Is I-90 above or below I-70? Above. above, right. So the highways that go across the country, the distance isn't constant, but they're in order. So the highway numbers are order. Now if I put them down the highway at 60 miles an hour and I pass, scientists said 12 miles, 13 miles, what number is that, what's that world? The mileage markers on the highway. That's order, too. That's it. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. That's right. The number plate on the car, what number is, what's that? Name. Name. Where does power come into effect, what? though? Where does power? Almost nothing is power. <laughs> the only thing I found that power is the, uh, the amount of gram, the amount of memory available per year. In the computer world, it's going power? up. It's, power. it's well, time self. I, the, it's time, it's time self. self. But isn't it power? The, the, the power scale. Okay. <laughs> well, that's what we're doing. <laughs> what, what world is that? And, yeah, and I screwed you up by putting a one. That really should be a zero. What, now, if we said closer, that's a, an add what? Add 10. That's, that's a plus 10, right? Now, what world is this? Multiplication. 
That's multiply? Yeah. 10. That's yeah. a 10 multiply. Right? Yeah. Now, here's what world is this? Now, if we go in the power, we go in the, you can have a zero in the add world, but there's no zero in the multiply world. We go in the power world, what would happen if we started with one? One times itself one, is one, one times, it's just like the zero in the, yeah. in the yeah. add world, See, on the multiply. Two. So, two. so, zero and one are both out in the power world. But we could start with 3.17 times itself is 10 <laughs> times itself is 100, right? Times itself is... <laughs> that's the power rule. <laughs> that's power. Okay. You haven't got to that yet. Well, what's the matter? They will laugh at us. <laughs> they, they, didn't, they didn't realize 3.17 was halfway up to what? 10? No, we no, thought it was pi. pi. <laughs> what is pi? Pi, pi r squared. Yeah, pi. That was close. That's nice. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. Pi r round. Cornbread r square. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you remember that joke from grade school? They didn't hear that, but it's too old time. <laughs> Pi R round, cornbread R square. <laughs> so don't go to the to the number worlds in there. But almost everything is in this world. And yet all of all of our measurement and everything is in this world. Even the IQ isn't in this world. The IQ is in the order world because the distance between the IQ of 110 and the IQ of 120 is not the same as 120 to 140 or 130. The, those distances don't mean anything in the IQ scale. So we, we're going to teach case of three, the kids' numbers this way. And they'll be able to... Uh, you know, we'll, say, we'll show them street numbers and automobile numbers and telephone numbers, and they'll be able to tell, sort them into which world they are. I think it's going to clarify the understanding. It's going to make math and make numbers more real. Yeah. A twelfth street is the twelfth street an add number or an order number? It's a name. What? No, it's an add. It's an order in most cities. Like New York or downtown Chicago, it's an ad because the yeah, exact distance from street to street yeah. is the same. But most, <laughs> like Boston, you forget it. I mean, it, it, it was like cow pass and everything. They got names and so forth. But. Is this chart paper available for ordering now? Yeah, you can fax order it or you can. And it's named, you see, the new name has the type of paper because we realize we'll have to change, like, like timings. It, 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 the first capital letter is what's across the bottom. And then the next lowercase letters are what's up the left. And then the number three is the particular form that that is. And E means it's in English, and C means it's commodity offset. Commodity paper. The, the daily chart is D, D per min and it's in English and S means uh, smooth offset. And if we were able to get this paper and do a new grid then it would be W. What does the P stand for? The what? The P. Per. Per. Timing P -E -R. Timing per minute. Which I, which He's a Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. <clears throat> This is the new daily permanent one. You'll see that, but it's been no. the second time since the time we got a tool. Yeah. Okay, they have to get back to class now. So uh, tomorrow, same time. Yeah. Anybody have any more questions before we break? Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. Tomorrow, 10 o'clock, bye. All right, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you again, Bob Warshin, for providing these and getting approval. If you're into this channel, make sure you subscribe down here. And over here is more videos that you may be interested. Thank you again. That's your Daily B.A.